What about artificial sweeteners? I feel like there was some major articles last year that really put a lot of doubt in people's mind about artificial sweeteners and how they're going to cause cancer. And the data was, you know, pretty convincing in an isolation that there is harm related to them. Yeah, no, I get I get asked this this quite a bit too. It's again tricky because you can find any study online. And this isn't to say that this study wasn't important. It was well done to to most degrees. But you can find any any paper online that links any sort of anything to cancer risks. And the truth of the matter is that aspartame does have some risks for cancers, but realistically, most people aren't going to consume or shouldn't be consuming that much aspartame that it's remotely close to increasing their cancer risks. So that degree of, of variability in, in humans is very wild regarding how aspartame can induce or increase risks for cancers. But overall, I would say that it's not going to, to impact most people, um, especially again, if people are using zero calorie beverages, as, as I often do as well, um, to try and regulate caloric intake to maintain a specific weight or engage in, in actually healthy behavior. So in general, with people who are using this tool appropriately, because it is a tool, people who are using it appropriately, the pros outweigh the cons uh, vastly, even if there is some minor risk. And then how much is too much, would you say? If the average person was like, I drink two cans of soda every day or, you know, diet soda specifically. Again, it depends on like the, the diet soda. But if it's like, you know, Diet Coke, which I think has like acesulfame in it or um, you know, sucralose or aspartame, one of those containing beverages, I would say 20 a day. Um, but I would, I would That's assume it, it's realistically, it's, it's much more than that. Realistically, the studies in mice, which, you know, has some translatability, not amazingly in mice, these studies, you know, you'd need to consume hundreds of cans of Diet Coke a day for, you know, significantly increased risks. But I would say anybody who's consuming 20 of these cans per day of, you know, Diet Coke or whatever, probably doesn't have their other ducks in a row regarding their nutrition either, if they're relying on on that many drinks. And then there's also the the component of excessive caffeine consumption along with these things too. So if I, you know, increase my caffeine consumption and it negatively affects my sleep health, that's going to impact a person more than uh, consuming 20 Diet Cokes a day and, and aspartame. You know what I'm saying? And they'll be in my office as a urologist because they'll be peeing yeah. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk about carcinogens. So, <laughs> so there's class one carcinogens. There's group or group one, group two, group three, group four. Group one is essentially carcinogenic to humans, which include things like smoking, alcohol, things that are indisputable. And, and I would argue, and again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there is something to suggest any amount of alcohol increases your risk to some degree, maybe not a lot, but some, right? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Okay. Even hormone replacement therapy ends up in that category, particularly estrogen, which is interesting to me, but it is on the list. Uh, yeah. And then group two is probably or possibly carcinogenic. And this is where all these things come in. There were some things that surprised me on this list. So red meats on this list, which I knew about, very hot beverages, night shift work. These are all probable carcinogens. I guess night shift work makes sense because of the sleep dysregulation. I did not know about the very hot beverages. And how do you define very hot, right? Like That's really interesting. Um, I imagine that's a weak correlation at best. And obviously the definition of very hot is, is obviously ambiguous. I would assume that that has something to do with a behavioral correlation between people who drink very hot beverages, whether it be like you know, again, excessive coffee consumption, maybe, you know, people who typically drink coffee, they drink it very hot, which certainly might be true if you're Italian, you know, people who grew up in, in Italy, they drink coffee more than most cultures, cultures, uh, Chinese people, uh, you know, where tea, Indian people as well, where tea is, is an integral part of, of culture, maybe even in the UK, um, again, excess caffeine consumption with tea. Um, there's also positive relationships between certain types of teas, like green tea has EGCG in it, which has some positive effects on cancer risk reduction. But again, I, I wager that that correlation there is, is largely due to poor behaviors that come with drinking these hot beverages um, and not directly because of them. So causation and correlation. Yeah, I do recall, I think, and if anyone is listening who is an expert in this area, please comment that high, uh, very hot temperatures, I think it's the way they affect the esophageal lining, perhaps. I'm not sure, but uh, that may be part of it. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'd be surprised. Uh, 
especially given that, I don't know, I, I would just be very surprised if, if we found that that was a variable in terms of inducing mutagenesis or something like that. I could see that being the case with maybe the hot beverages are burned or you're or in, in heating, you're producing some sort of low amount of carcinogen such that if I can consume a lot of it over time, maybe. Um, and that's yeah. certainly true with, you know, grilled meats as an example, or, uh, or obviously smoking cigarettes or inhaling combustible material. Perhaps it could be a link yeah. there. And then red meat I know is very contentious. The data is there that supports it. However, a lot of med- red meats are high in saturated fats, which then also increase weight and then put you at higher risk. Anything to add on that point? So from what we know about red meat as well is, is it's most of the time because of how people cook red meats and even chickens. If, if you grill any sort of red meat or any sort of protein for that matter, even plants, if you grill it under high heat, you're going to induce uh, the formation of carcinogens on the, on the surface of the meat while simultaneously creating that nice Maillard reaction, you know, the crispiness of the, the protein on the, on the surface of the meat that, you know, provides that, that nice mouthfeel when you, when you have a good steak or, or a grilled chicken or something like that or salmon. But it, cr- it produces these carcinogens called polyaromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines, which, you know, obviously if you consume enough of those in terms of grilled meat consumption, you're, they're carcinogens. So there's a pretty causative link there in association with those. But as you point out, it's also about we're consuming these, these red meats as, as a total component of our overall nutrition. If somebody is consuming primarily beef and red meat and they're grilling it all the time and they're not consuming veggies and they're not paying attention to other components or dairy in their diet or breads or any of those other things. Um, and it's mostly just meats, uh, particularly red meats. That's where we see the health effects. I just reviewed this study on the dietary inflammatory index and it's, it's an index which has pro-inflammatory foods and anti-inflammatory foods, but it takes in the totality of your diet, right? So if you're having red meat more than twice a week, then it becomes, you get a point that's positive. But then if you're eating a certain number of servings of vegetables, you reduce the point. So I think, again, taking in the totality of your diet as a whole is is really important. A lot of this inflammatory stuff can be quite confusing, arguably inflammatory. I think people don't understand this because it's very confusing. Inflammation in our body is is very diverse and and a necessary thing. Like right now, you and I are both experiencing some degree of inflammation. It's the type of inflammatory responses that matter and how strong and often these types of responses matter. So trying to categorize things based on an, an inflammatory index, if we don't understand what those inflammatory responses are, can be very confusing to most people. And, and I'm actually not an immunologist. I understand enough about immunology through my training uh, because it is an integral part uh, of my training. But I try and convey this to people that you know, inflammatory responses are both good and bad. It's the type of inflammatory responses we need to understand in relation to not only our foods, but but everything in our environments that um, can can affect our health. It's not an all or nothing. Yeah. Not all inflammation is bad. Absolutely. And right. I think people will often say, well, that's inflammatory. It's bad for you. And not necessarily, yeah. right? We need uh, our body's response to inflammation is actually a good thing in terms of evolution and, and a whole host of other things. The group 2B, and you can look all these up on the CDC website, possibly carcinogenic, included some interesting things too. Ginkgo biloba, which a lot of people use for erectile function, which I don't think works that well, I'll be honest. Kava extract and aloe vera. So I was like sort of surprised. A lot of people use these things pretty regularly. Again, these lists I think can create a lot of fear. And like you look at them and there's like a million compounds on there that, you know, in t- in large quantities would absolutely be carcinogenic, but like you might find exposure to them everywhere. And so I think it's- I mean, the, uh, the, the aloe vera thing is kind of funny to me though too, is because one of the first things that comes to mind with aloe vera is to treat- sunburn. And so if somebody is chronically getting sunburn and they're applying aloe vera on their skin, it's often very hard to mechanistically dissociate the two in literature and say that it's the aloe vera and not the fact that this person is chronically sunburned. Right. So absolutely. I think that's something people need to understand too, is that it's, it's really hard with these epidemiological studies to parse apart actual causation from things like aloe vera or even ginkgo biloba. I'm not sure. I'm not even, I've seen it on the lists, but, uh, 
you know, some of these things shock me too. Yeah. And I think, again, the important part here is like a lot of these come from causation correlation studies. No one is randomizing people for, I mean, the amount of time it takes to develop a cancer, right? No one's randomizing people for 10, 20 years on one thing or not. And then right. seeing, yes, this is definitely causing and controlling for everything else, right? Like you can't, right. you can't literally control for everything else. And so I think to take these lists with a grain of salt, but obviously there are some things where the ratio of risk is so high that we're pretty certain, like smoking causes lung cancer. Mm -hmm. We can pretty definitively say that. Um, whereas other things, maybe not so much. Yeah. So, I mean, it always depends on the level of evidence to support something. And that's eventually that's what gets something between different classes of carcinogens. At some point, cigarette smoking was a, a class 3B or whatever the hell the designation is there for carcinogens on the, on the WHO website or even the IARC. But, you know, with, with more evidence, uh, you know, you can move those things up and, and determine how, how causative those things are for cancers. Absolutely. So what do you think about when you hear stories where somebody maybe reversed their cancer by doing X, Y, Z on some, you know, some diet or some supplement routine, they didn't have any sort of traditional Western medicine. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that is actually true? Or do you think that there's more to it? Of course, I think there's more to it. I think online, it's very easy to show positive outcomes from people who only have incentive to show positive outcomes. Now, it doesn't mean that this stuff can't happen. It doesn't mean that spontaneous remission can't happen in somebody that does have cancer. But usually in these reports, you're only seeing less than a much, much less than a percent of the, the, the total picture. Oftentimes, we don't even know if this person had cancer. And I'm not saying that they don't. But in these a lot of these reports, you don't even know the type of cancer. We don't know the staging. Sometimes people go to these obscure clinics out in, in Mexico or some random place in the world and they get quote unquote diagnosed by somebody that they have cancer and they probably don't. And then they get them on the supplement protocol. They tell them to go do like ozone therapy and these other things and the keto diets. And my dad went to Jamaica and he said, you know, because he, he recently had um, melanoma on his nose because it you know runs in the family. We've got a lot of moles in our family and, and it's just a risk factor. Somebody there told him, you know, eat a bunch of sour sop every day and, you know, do this detox. And it, it, immediately those things frustrate me. And again, it's not to say that you can't have spontaneous remission by doing these things, but they're just not usually well supported. Again, it's not that I don't want to believe them. It's that there's not evidence to make me strongly believe in them. I mean, that's my job as a scientist is to use what I know and the things that I test to be able to determine how truthful something is. And if there isn't enough of that, then I'm still left with an I don't know at the end of the day. And now while this might make my life very confusing and arguably give me trust issues in many ways, the things that I do know it gives me a lot of confidence in, you know, I'm just happy with saying, I don't know to those things. Whereas a lot of people will go online and push out this information. And the upsetting thing for me about that is it might dissuade somebody who actually does have cancer from getting treatment that they actually need that will significantly help them. It might not be optimal because obviously with therapeutics, there's cons associated with it. But the idea is that with these treatments, the pros far outweigh the cons and specifically targeting that person's cancer. But if they forego their therapy because they you know, went to Jamaica and this guy was like, oh, take soursop, that'll take care of it. Take vitamin D. How about this NAD supplement that you know Dr. Sinclair always talks about online because it affects metabolic flux and a bunch of jargon and, and you know somebody sounds smart online. Next thing you know, that person's disease is getting worse and worse and a lot of people die, but we don't see those online because they don't have to legally report deaths of patients. They only have to, you know, report the positive outcomes and the positive outcomes usually from those people are arbitrary because they're not capable of assessing positive outcomes in the first place. I know that was a long winded response, but that's the, the nature of the situation. It's tricky. It is absolutely. Have you had some stories where people did something that they thought was going to help cure their cancer and they ultimately got worse or maybe even died because of misinformation they heard online or saw or I see it far too often. A lot of people, I can count the numbers on more than two hands. People approach me every day too. They message me on social media too. And you know, my, my grandmother has cancer. My mom has cancer. My brother has cancer. And 
you know, so-and-so I, I read in Dr. Stephen Gundry's book that, you know, you can do this and prevent cancer. And, you know, if you don't give people the appropriate specifics behind these things, they, they it can be very misleading. Often it, it just makes their cancer worse. And, and, and a lot of the times for me, it's, it's about preserving the integrity of life because oftentimes if somebody does have cancer, depending on how late stage it is, it's often about improving quality of life where possible. Uh, so that they can live the longest with their condition. They still might die from cancer, but I often have to think about the things that I can realistically tell these people such that they don't listen to the, the quacky advice out there because it's, it's far too, too common and that they integrate the things that have sufficient backing uh, into their lives to improve their quality of life such that if they do at the end of the day die of cancer, their life was prolonged because they implemented evidence and not, for lack of a better word, quackery. I think as a clinician, it's really important to, when you receive a diagnosis of cancer, is to have a discussion about how long is this treatment going to prolong my life versus if I did nothing and what will my quality of life look like? Because I think a lot of times, and uh, you know, in studies, and we review studies all the time, in prostate cancer, to, you know, it's probably the most robust in urology where we're doing a lot of research. And you'll see there'll be an improvement in overall survival, but it may be on the order of months to a year. And I think it really depends on, you know, and then there are side effects, of course. So I think it's important to have those discussions, not to say that you should always forego treatment, but maybe that's right for you, right? And maybe it's not. But I think you should be educated and ask those questions because those we can give you data on, but I can't give you data on your sour sap. Like how long is it going to prolong your life? And you know, what's going to happen if you take it or not take it. Right. I think that's why people sometimes feel frustrated because there's no, there's no free lunch here. Like you've got to decide longer life with maybe some side effects, shorter life with worse, you know, met metastasizing cancer. You know, those are tough decisions to make. Yeah. And it's a really hard discussion to have too, because cancer outcomes, even if, you know, two people have the same exact cancer, cancer outcomes are very variable between people. So even, even if two people have the same esophageal cancer at the same exact stage, one might respond to treatment, whereas the other may not respond at all. And there's, you know, still a lot of details that we're still trying to understand as cancer biologists as to why that can happen. But that level of variability doesn't usually translate well to giving somebody a prognosis. And oftentimes doctors will err on the side of caution and give you a lesser time frame rather than a longer time frame. Um, just because that's just the safest bet. But that can be pretty crappy to hear as a, as a cancer patient. Um, and so I, I try and temper a lot of people's emotions regarding prognoses. But it's also, as you point out, with quality of life, you know, if somebody does have cancer or any disease for that matter, and they, they go through a certain treatment for a period of time and, and they have refractory disease, as in the case of cancer, their cancer goes away because of one treatment, but then it comes back, which is, you know, basically a different disease at that point. It's not even the same cancer because it's evolved in such a way that now the first treatment won't work. And this is typically uh, what we call as chemo resistance uh, or refractory disease. Sometimes depending on that person's lifestyle, you might have to make the tough decision that depending on their age, their, their quality of life, maybe not having treatment and just living out the rest of your days as happily as possible with your family is going to be better than being on a drug that doesn't have the highest likelihood of success because your your cancer is refractory. And that's a really sad and tough discussion to have. And, uh, you know, we had that with my mom when uh, when I was young. And for me as a 17 year old, you know, it's 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 a really hard discussion to have. But no matter your age, it's it's not it's not easy. So really, it's it's all about preserving quality of life. Where we can. If you like this clip from the Rena Malik MD podcast with Dr. Joseph Sandel, make sure you check out the full video right here.